On the 17th of February, 1872, three native Filipino priests were executed for allegedly instigating the Cavite Mutiny that January. Also on that day, the concept of Filipino nationhood was born. After over 150 years, their story was immortalized by the Jesuits and the resulting film was seen by millions just last Christmas as it be- became one of the top entries for the famed Metro Manila Filmed Festival. So in this episode of the Intrepid Podcast, we will be reviewing the film dedicated to the, uh, to the life and death of fathers Mariano Gomez, Jose Burgos, and Jacinto Zamora, collectively known in history as the Gomburza. But as a history buff, this would be two things. A field day and an appreciation piece. Because I am recording this way beyond the the festival period. So I'm going to review this in a way that we would see it beyond the hype. With that said, the Intrepid Podcast starts now. I am Ian Rignon, an independent alternative media practitioner, among other things, and welcome to a very special episode of the Intrepid Podcast. And as I said in the intro, we are going to review the Jose or Pepe Diokno uh, film called Gomburza, which is basically a biopic of the three priests that I have mentioned earlier in the intro. Now, let me give you a backstory of how I get to uh, to watch the film and in the first place, how did this even happen? So, last year, uh, 2022, was the 150th anniversary of the execution of the Gomburza. And uh, it was actually it was actually uh, not really celebrated but commemorated by the Archdiocese of Manila by basically offering a mass. Uh, I actually thought it was a requiem mass for the three priests but it was um, it was something else. Uh, entirely, and I don't, and I don't really know why. But after the mass, the priests of Manila and other places uh, surrounding it uh, processed or made a procession from the Manila Cathedral to the to Luneta, to the execution site of the Gomburza, which is basically just a little bit uh, closer. To the to the execution site of uh, Jose Rizal, so uh, that's that. And bes- and besides, Luneta is actually an execution site in Manila. So uh, who knows how many dead bodies uh, were uh, were seen there? And besides, uh, a lot of sieges and battles also ha- uh, happened. So I am not even sure if that place can be excavated uh, in the near future. But, you know, as someone who really wanted to uh, become an archaeologist, maybe, maybe not, why not, diba? Right? But as someone who uh, has an interest in archaeology, especially uh, for, historical, uh, for historical purposes, I would really see that as a good, uh, as a good, progress when it comes to the field but before we go uh, on tangents let me give give you the backstory of how I get to watch the, the film so uh, the Metro Manila Film Festival always begins on Christmas Day uh, every December 25th and it just so happened that 
in my uh in my current job i basically uh was given the chance to uh not work on philippine holidays so uh that's uh that's actually a bit weird for me because i normally or not really normally but i tend to uh work on philippine holidays and rest on client holidays but uh, uh given my uh given my bpo background but this is different and uh somehow i am still uh are you reeling but i am still a bit um adjusting after 10 years of uh that kind of uh that kind of setup that you're gonna uh that you're gonna you know uh still work on uh on public holidays so i still want i still want to of course i still want to uh especially if um uh you know if it's very important uh when it comes to my job but then again uh maybe i should also count my blessings for that <laughs> so uh christmas day i don't have a, uh, i don't have work the next uh, the day after i also don't have work for that uh for some reason uh so yeah so that and and also uh december 25 of 2023 was a monday the sunday before uh i also asked not to work because every sunday night i i work uh for at least four hours uh it's half day work on the weekends so i opted on a sunday night because everything uh, every uh so that i can basically uh start my week uh after after going to mass so that's that but then again uh christmas eve i didn't work christmas day i didn't work and the day after St. Stephen's or Boxing Day, I also didn't work. So uh, it's a win-win-win. <laughs> so that's that. Now, on Christmas Eve, I rode a bicycle to towards um, St. James Parish in uh, Muntinlupa inside Ayala Alabang Village. So that uh, basically I scouted the area and uh, saw where, would, where should I go so that I can go to St. Ja- James for the traditional Latin mass there, I, I thought on that day, uh, it was a uh, it was uh, the mass for the fourth Sunday of Advent. But it happened to be a Christmas vigil mass, so <laughs> um, just like Easter vigil, we I I technically celebrated Christmas very early, <laughs> so that's that. And then the next day, uh, since we didn't uh. The people here in Intrepid HQ didn't have any plans to go uh, somewhere on Christmas Day. We stayed put. I told the Father General to to give uh, to give candies to those who are uh, to those who are knocking on our doors on Christmas Day and uh, basically uh, saying na mamas ko po. And uh, yeah, I uh, I told him uh, that. No, don't say that's the best that that's the uh that's the most we can give they would appreciate it okay i don't really know what what's what's wrong with my own father but you know that's that uh i have told him that's uh at least we are giving this christmas we are not giving uh something uh in past christmases and this is the first time that i'm doing i personally am doing this by uh, buying candies for people uh out of goodwill of the season so that's um that's basically uh my uh way of doing it and i just hope that my father would appreciate it but yeah that's uh that's very that's too personal so yeah uh since we don't have any plans for christmas so uh i decided to cycle as well back to st james the thing is, <laughs> I got drunk the night before, so that's that. And I, I only woke up a bit late. I was late for the mass. 
I have to uh, I have to uh, admit I was late for the mass and the and the security in Ayala Alabang is very uh very tough. You know, it's its own town to be you know, to be uh, to be to be frank, but uh that's what exclusive villages are for you here in the Philippines at the very least. And especially if you're on a bicycle, they look down on cyclists for some reason, or even visitors from uh, outside. So, but then again, I can't blame those uh, security people. They are doing their jobs. So the uh, the bottom line, I was late for the mass, but at the very least, I got to the gospel part, <laughs> to the to the point that. Uh, the priest was uh, was reading from the first chapter of the Gospel of St. John, which is basically the gospel reading for Christmas Day, for the day, uh, or for the rest of the day, that is, because there are three Masses for, uh, for Christmas. There's a Midnight Mass, the Dawn Mass, and uh, the Mass during the day. Since it's uh, 9 or 10 in, in the morning, it's the Mass during the day. And it's the one that has uh, the phrase and the word became flesh and dwelt upon us. So, after all that was said and done, I had lunch. And I basically, uh, I basically uh, uh, bought a ticket for the next showing of Gomburza. And that was during the, uh, the afternoon. I, I never realized how uh how would it be received given the given the notor- notoriety of uh of philippine cinema and its and its uh, reception and the public reception of biopics or uh of historical films so i took the frontmost seat so that i could not be distracted by the people behind behind me and uh, I was the front most uh in um in that um in that particular showing and I was absolutely surprised by uh, uh that the cinema cinema was at least 60% full for a biopic and uh and a pinoy biopic at that so I am definitely surprised uh, about the reception. And the last time this happened was more than, um, was actually uh, during the period uh, or during the Gerald Tarog films, uh, General Luna and Goyo Ang Batang General. So basically, these are the two Filipino um, historical films uh, made by Gerald Tarog, uh, which is now um, PBA Studios Classics. That's, that's, that's for sure. And I'm definitely hoping that uh, the film about Manuel Quezon would also be uh, would also be shown in the near future. I do hope for that, and I do hope uh, personally to uh, basically uh, have um, or so that uh, I do hope that more biopics or more historical Filipino films would be. Uh, would be of this quality, uh, and not just up uh, in Tagalog puchu puchu lang, or uh, uh, just uh, uh, film it for the sake of having a uh, having content, content. So that's that. Now, I have uh, spent quarter of an hour uh, talking about my personal experience about this film. And now we go to the historical context. Spoiler, spoiler alert. Uh, this is a uh, spoiler alert. And uh, if you haven't watched the film, click off now. I definitely, um, I definitely mean it. I don't care if I, I have, uh, if I do not have uh, a lot of views or uh, uh, listens or I don't know of. Uh, I don't know what <laughs> or uh or hits for this uh for this episode of the Intrepid podcast but I mean it when I say that if you haven't watched it uh the film click er, or um click 
click away now. I I beg you, please uh, watch the film so that you would understand where the hell do I come from. Okay? Now, if you haven't clicked off or you're still listening, uh, thank you very much if you have... You have watched it already or if you haven't and you just wanted to know about uh, or you know uh have due diligence about the film watch or listen at your own risk so the film tied together the story of the birth of the mexican state thanks to a criollo catholic priest uh and the earlier revolt of Apoli- apolinario de la cruz or aka hermano pule and the cofradia de san jose However, the film forgot to mention or factor in the Spring of Nations of 1848 and the earlier Philippine Empire stint uh, by, uh, uh, that, was, uh, that was done by disgruntled mestizos, or mestizos uh, as a result of the Mexican War of Independence. So, uh, I don't know how the hell did they miss this out, but uh, how the... Uh, the filmmakers missed out the Spring of Nations and the, and uh, didn't dive deep into the Mexican War of Independence. But again, I I do think they uh they are uh, out of time because they they really wanted to uh, perhaps they really wanted to have this uh, shown at the MMFF. That's why there are some historical factors that uh, were. Uh, that were uh, that were sidelined. Now, as you all know, as you uh, understand Philippine history, the the fight here, uh, the fight before the Rev- the Philippine Revolution, is about native Filipino priests versus Spanish friars, the frailes, the religious orders, and um, come to think of it. It's very um it's very tragic that it had to be this way because the film highlighted the enmity between uh the frailes and the and the seglares or the indio or indio or um diocesan uh native filipino priests so uh th- here's an important nuance to note to be um to be uh, fair because the quality of priestly formation in the Sp- in Spanish Philippines was absolutely ambiguous. There are those who are like uh, Father Pedro Pelaez, the uh, the leader of the secular movement before Gomburza, and they are basically uh, they're basically uh, uh, innocent at worst and saintly at best. But there are also uh, those who were like Father uh, Severino Severino Maliari, which is basically another MMFF film, and if given the time and if it's still uh, if it's still around in cinemas, I might watch it, but I do doubt it is. But I'll I'll review it once I uh, once I see it, um, or maybe I'll just uh, refer to other uh, to other creators who are more on history such as Kirby Araulio he definitely did a video about um about um Father Severino Severino Maliari so that's that and then uh that's um that's how it goes now the bishops of the time uh have not been as firm as they should be because uh spoiler alert they're Spanish, so they do not want to uh, basically. Uh, my butt hurt, but you know, uh, they do not want to uh, uh, be at loggerheads with their fellow Spaniards. If you know, if you get my drift, uh, especially in uh, late nineteenth century Spanish Philippines, when um, when most of the Spanish Empire had already. Uh, declared their independence, and you only have what four, uh, four archipel or four island territories, uh, in your at your disposal. And one of them happens to be the largest, which is basically the Philippines. So that's uh, 
So that's how it goes. And some of them are actually, some of the bishops, the, the, the Spanish bishops during that time, were actually religious friars prior to their episcopal consecration. So that's an added disadvantage also to, uh, to the secular or native priests during the time. And during this time period, the first Vatican Council was underway, but, but it was cut short by Italian Republicans or the Italian Republican Revolution. Thus, all uh, Vatican I proceedings have not been published far enough or uh, it hadn't have, it ha- haven't had uh, any, uh, any uh, significant impact on the Catholic Church uh, prior, to, um, prior to Vatican II. So that's how it um, that's how it goes, and uh, also I have to say that uh, another plus point for this uh, for this film is the new uh, somehow nuanced um, framing of the friars because not all of the friars are cruel and evil and all that shit, especially the Augustinian recollects because. One of them happened to be a saint who basically uh, did saintly things during his time in the Philippines. And I am talking about Saint Ezekiel Moreno or San Ezekiel Moreno. This guy or this uh, friar, when, when he was still a friar, he did a lot of things for the Filipino people or for the native Filipinos especially uh, in Santo Tomas Patangas, in Las Piñas, and in Imus. Basically, uh, these are uh, these are recollect territories during that time, and uh, and he definitely did a lot of things. Uh, one of them happens to be uh, the the dam that he repaired or uh, upgraded in the boundary of uh, Las Piñas and Bacoor in Cavite. So. Uh, and uh, I ha- I definitely had uh, crossed it uh, when w- in one of my cycling journeys. But then again, it was closed off for some reason. And it sucks that it's no longer a pedestrian bridge. Uh, but uh, during, that, during that time, it was St. Ezequiel Moreno who, uh, who basically repaired and um, upgraded that, uh, that dam. And a lot of dams in Cavite were built by the recollects. But then again, it's a story for another day. And the reason why I do uh, commend uh, the, the filmmakers for, uh, for this nuanced framing of the friars is because they, they added uh, the puppet show scene uh, near the end of the film wherein uh, somehow the, the friars uh, understood or realized that they were duped by the Spanish government in Manila. And we're gonna talk about them later on in this episode. Now, when it comes to secularization and liberalization, or liber, uh, liberalism rather, there is a divide between, uh, should I say, the religious aspect of it and the secular aspect of it. Because... Fathers Pelaez, Gomez, and Burgos were pushing for the secularization of Catholic parishes in the Philippines, especially in the Archdiocese of Manila where they are incarnated uh, during that time, in order to evangelize the natives better, which is something the Spanish friars have been struggling ever since they, um, they claimed the Philippines as their own. Now, out of this issue... Uh, sprouted the concept of Los Filipinos, the Filipino people, which is composed of natives, mestizos, and criollos. And this in turn pissed off the Spanish frailes. Yeah, really. Uh, The term Los Filipinos really pissed off the Spanish frailes uh, and as well as um, the Spanish people, 
maybe. But then again, at the same time, native Freemasons who label themselves as liberales or liberals took the opportunity to uh, somehow um, go after or um, follow Father, Father Burgos's anonymous manifesto for Los Filipinos. However, the film failed to name the liberals as Freemasons, uh, but it subtly provided clues such as hand gestures, deep pockets, and a whole network of acquaintances. So, uh, as someone who is a Catholic and uh, understands that Freemasonry was uh, something that plagued uh, our nation and the uh, and the Philippine Church as a whole, ever since, I do, uh, I don't know why uh, uh, the filmmakers didn't uh, 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 call the spade a spade for what it actually is. Because the main, un- the, the, the absolute antagonists for this film are not the frailes themselves, not the Spanish government, but the Freemasons uh, in Spanish Filipino society. It's them who killed off the Gomburza. Because, uh, you know, after the Cavite mutiny, uh, the Freemasons or the, the Liberales cut their losses. They absolutely cut their losses and, uh, uh, you know, found ways in order for them to be uh, exonerated and uh, not be blamed for uh, the Cavite mutiny and pin, the, pin all the blame on a fall guy and the three priests. So that's, uh, that's a failed opportunity on the on the on the filmmaker's part and I'm just getting started uh to be uh to be to be absolutely frank now there's also two historical figures who were um who were featured in this film it's not that that are not priests Felipe Buencamino and Pasiano Mercado Rizal Pasiano Mercado Rizal basically the the older brother of the more famous Jose. Now, both Buen Camino and uh, Pasha, uh, both uh, Buen Camino and the older Rizal, uh, were students of Father Burgos. But in the film, it somehow, or uh, it's uh, they somehow uh, made sure that there is a distinction between these two. Because Buen Camino was brash and outspoken, while Rizal, the older Rizal was silent and contemplative. And this went on, actually, until the, the end of their lives and how they impacted Filipino history as it is. Felipe Buen Camino, as you all know, became, uh, became one, of the, one of the traitors in the Philippine-American War. The bigger traitor was Pedro Paterno, but uh numero dos is uh Buen Camino and as you all know uh Pasiano Rizal was the kuya or the older brother or the only brother of Jose Rizal and uh, later on after his younger brother's execution he became uh a general for the Katiponeros in Laguna so uh, and he also took uh took his widow, Josephine Bracken, under his wing. Uh, that's, uh, and that's how it goes. Now, I would be remiss if I would not say, if, if I wouldn't say that uh, what happened to the Gomburza or to the Filipino nation is Spain's own wrongdoing. Because number one, Filipino forces, native Filipino forces have been disadvantaged the all this time because um, like many empires 
colonial powers uh, levied native troops for not only law enforcement but also to augment uh, their own regiments or their own um, uh, their own uh, Spanish or uh, European regiments. So uh, that's that's that. And number two, they also ref- they also refused to teach native Filipinos number one the Spanish language and number two the tenets of the Catholic faith, such a, uh, um, uh, especially the Catechism of the Council of Trent. That was uh, the that was the uh, most impactful catechism during that time, and they have not been uh, the Spaniards have not been keen on. Uh, teaching uh, these things uh, during that time, uh, especially in the 19th century. Perhaps they were burnt out after centuries of being um, being present in the Philippines. And, you know, this is, uh, this is the symptom of, uh, of the Philippine church nowadays, wherein um, there's this term called sacramentalized but not catechized. And it, it and it wasn't uh it wasn't uh, shown enough in uh in the film so that's also an, another minus for this film now uh as we all know as we all know there are as we all know the uh the film uh, ended up with uh the execution of the gomburza it was very much um very much stirring and uh it also um factored in the faith of these three priests father zamora lost his mind during the time that he was um he, he was uh imprisoned and executed so um perhaps uh the church uh commended him uh commended him to god's mercy father gomez accepted his faith and you know among the three of them, perhaps he can be, um, you know, he can be, uh, there, there can be a cause for canonization for at least Father Gomez and Father Pelaez for heroic virtues. Perhaps Pelaez for heroic virtues, Gomez for um, perhaps offering of life or heroic virtues, virtues as well. Maybe, just maybe. But uh, technically, they are confessors. But, uh, Father Gomez can be considered a martyr. I don't know. I uh, I am not really uh, an expert in church um uh, on church stuff. I am just a simple Catholic who just so happened to know a lot of things uh when it when it comes to Catholicism. So that's that. As for Father Burgos, he he was um uh, he was hysterical at the uh at the last. Uh, he. He somehow uh, told him, "Why is uh, the world so cruel? Why is it unjust? Um, I am innocent. Why should I die?" And the priest, who was uh, the fellow priest, who was uh, who was consoling him, was saying, "Even Christ, who is innocent, died." And somehow. He came back to his senses and understood that perhaps what he is uh, at, uh he is uh offering his life not only for the native Filipino people but also as a sacrifice holy and pleasing to God and I do hope that was what he was thinking on his final moments on earth. Now, we go to a lot of things. Uh, and now, basically, we're talking about commendation and, crit- and criticisms because in this day and age where young people are beginning to forget their uh, our history, rather, and not listening to George Santayana's prophetic warning, uh, films like Gomburza are a heaven sent 
as it allowed the public to at least know that something like the execution of the three priests, dare I say unjustly by the Spanish Freemasonic by a Spanish Freemasonic cabal actually happened. And you know, uh basically the the film made a real attempt in making accurate costumes for the film similar to uh, TBA's historical films. Now, having said that, this is the point that I am going to uh this is the point that I am going to basically uh trash the film uh, and uh, trash the film and talk shit about the film because there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of nitpicks that I have um, I have mentioned or I have um, I have seen in this film as someone who happens to uh, be a history buff and a Catholic at the same fucking time so first of all I noticed language inconsistencies when it comes to the when it comes to the to the casts, especially the Spaniard, uh, the Spaniard, uh, Span- Spanish characters in the in the film. There are some who like Jaime Fabregas who nailed their roles as Spanish characters, and perhaps Jaime Fabregas as as a mestizo himself uh, nailed his. Um, his role as Archbishop Meliton Martinez uh, in the film, uh, I do commend him. And uh, the MMFF uh, had a miss, missed opportunity to ma- uh, to do something about his role as Archbishop Martinez in the MMFF. So that's that. However, other than that, uh, I noticed that there are Andalusian and Mexican accents uh, for the Spanish characters. Uh, when it should be Castilian. What do I mean? The the syllables C E C I C E C I and uh, Z or Z uh should be pronounced as th th uh T H. Uh so when you, uh if you noticed earlier, uh especially in the in the way that I first on uh pronounced the name uh, Father Jacinto Zamora I uh, pronounced it as Jacinto Zamora, and I n- and you also noticed uh, somehow um, that I pronounced some of the names, uh, some of the Span- uh, Spanish sounding names with a with a C E C I or a Z uh, as th, and it should be that way, and that's uh, that's something that the filmmakers uh, overlooked. Well, that's one of the things that, uh, you know, one of the major things that was overlooked during the production of the film. Secondly, there is a lack of visual timestamps, unlike other historical films. Given that there are um, there are chapter divisions, perhaps it would be better that it that uh, time visual timestamps were created so that. Uh, so that the viewers who do not have any fucking idea about the the timeline of the uh of the Gomburza affair would understand that okay this happened at this date this happened at that date. No, they just made the uh, chapter divisions, and you know, I'm not uh I'm not against it, but what the fuck is its use in the film? Okay, what the fuck is its use in the film? What's the use of these uh of these chapter divisions if I if I have to be specific when you can always always go with the timestamps that uh especially on the on the day itself on the day of execution itself February 17 1872 is it too much is it too much and you know I'm the the one that I am partial to is uh where I am livid is that the film was directed by Pepe Diokno who happens to be I don't know the son of liberal pro alphabet politician Chel Diokno so uh somehow there is a little bit of a woke um a little bit of a woke 
um tincture or uh, a woke tint on the film given that it was um given that they have advertised it in such a way that hearts must be burning alab ng puso uh that they they marketed the shit out of that uh out of that phrase burning hearts alab ng puso you know it would be nice actually if they thought about something else other than alab ng puso but then again it is what it is the script was also more more focused on nationalism and the concept of filipino identity over insisting on the secularization of catholic clergy while in the uh in, in, in the Spanish Filipino Church, as per the Council of Trent and Vatican I. However, to be fair, the two were intertwined by the fact that Father Pelaez uh, allegedly envisioned the concept of los Filipinos, alluding to the uh, to the natives and half bloods instead of the Spaniards. And uh, the one that I'm also partial to is the battle scenes. It was fucking poor. Okay. I do not see any action at all when it comes to the uh, when it comes to the battle scenes. I understand that it was just a simple mutiny, but they would have they should have uh, put some um, you know put some effort to uh, to making it very very realistic. Given the budget. Look at Tenera Luna. TBA Studios was not yet uh was not yet um uh founded during the time it was filmed, but Gerald Tarog had a fucking vision on how uh on how battles should be done. Okay, uh it was um it was somehow just like a a small skirmish than a than a full blown battle. I uh, but uh, I'll give them that they made an effort to make it more epic. Pepe Diokno missed that opportunity. Also, there were also the presence of post-Vatican II interior church implements in that um in that film. First of all, there's an ambo instead of a pulpit. Ambos were, uh, are these podiums or uh, should I say replacements for the pulpit uh, after the Second Vatican Council. And uh, basically they, uh, they are the, um, uh, let's just say uh, they are the replacements for the pulpit. Because in earlier or in, post, in pre-Vatican II church architecture, or in an interior design, if I uh, if I add, pulpits are used by priests in order for them to deliver their sermons to the congregation because there are no there were no microphones during that time. There were no microphones during that time, so that means they have to go on an elevation. They have to uh, go at the, at the middle of the church if that um uh at some point or at some uh, at some churches that I was I was in, uh. That I have visited, uh, some of the old churches that is, and uh, so that their voice can be amplified uh, to the to the people more than uh, than than him speaking from the sanctuary. So that's one uh, that's one nitpick that I have um, that I have made. And there's also, and I think this was a technical um sci- the te- a technical um. Oversight, yeah, technical oversight. That was the thing that I was uh, wanting to say uh, at the at the top of my head. This is a technical over- oversight, and there was um, there were images of um, uh, anachronistic, um, anachronistic uh, images uh, in the film, such as the Virgin Mary under the title Our Lady of Fatima. Like, come on! The apparition happened in 1917. 
This was the 1860s or 1870s. For fucking out loud. I don't know. Why did they had uh, why did they um why didn't they saw that? But then again, I noticed that there were little to no um technical advisory from uh antiquarians or at the very least um uh, Catholics who appreciate the traditional Latin mass and everything and uh, and their own church history. So I guess that's um that's that. Also another thing that I I nitpick about is that the film crew used Taalstown Center to mimic old Manila. Like what the fuck? First of all, the Governor's General of Spanish Philippines transferred to the Malacañang after the earthquake of 1863 that killed Father Pelaez. And secondly, Taal Basilica could never mimic the Manila Cathedral or even San Miguel de Malacañang for that matter. And you know what? This is a bit petty, but you know, Romar Chuka was an extra for the film. Perhaps I am livid that uh, he became an extra for a film because, uh, because of what he personally believes in. And uh, let me be frank, not a lot of Catholics like Romar Chuka. Even my parish priest who is a Josefino, okay? A Josefino is a seminarian or an alumnus of San Jose Seminary inside the Ateneo and uh, Chuka was Chuka is, uh, is uh, basically affiliated to the Jesuits. Even my parish priest, who is, an, is, is a Josefino, dislike Romar Chuka and his, uh, and his shenanigans as a quote-unquote Catholic comedian when all of that is bullshit. Sorry, uh, I'm, just, um, I'm just a bit... Uh, I'm, a, I'm a bit livid about that. And I know this is a bit petty as well, but why aren't the Dominicans, why aren't the Dominicans um, involved in the production of this film? The three priests are alumni of the University of Santo Tomas, an institution run by the Dominicans up to this day. And as someone who studied there, I was expecting... I was absolutely expecting at least Tomasian alumni involved in that film or technical advisory from the Dominicans. But I don't see anything. I don't, I don't see anything from the Black Friars. Nothing. It's tragic that the Dominicans have been sidelined. And to be honest, the Dominicans should have been involved because exactly because Father Burgos, at the very least, is a Thomasian. It's it's really you know, it's really tragic that he was uh you know he was sidelined for this shit. It's I mean the the Dominicans were sidelined uh to this shit. And uh, let me go ahead and quote a Dominican friar and his uh, and his uh, review or uh, commentary regarding Gomburza. And I quote: "Gomburza is a decent film, but it has serious flaws that can't be ignored. The cinematography, color grading, the actors—they are all Netflix Netflix worthy. Sobrang husay. The biggest drawback." is storytelling. It failed to establish the tension that led to the to the execution scene. Kulang! Ang tagal ng kwento! The Cavita mutiny just happened in passing. Nagulat na lang ako, inaresto na yung tatlong pare. And of course, sino madadala sa execution scene but the movie lacked the needed build-up to, the highlight, to highlight the garote scene as the movie's climax. The cringy epilogue that capped the film was unnecessary. Mas drama ko yung bagsak na mensahe ng garote scene 
if the movie ended just there, or they went on without all the motherhood statements on the on the revolution, nationalism, etc. that followed. The epilogue deprived the garrote scene of conveying its own message to the audience. Their bittersweet martyrdom in Bagumbayan, basically this is Luneta, is in, ex- in itself a powerful call to action. But the scene was quickly overshadowed by, ser- by a series of visual presentations that reminded me more of tableaus meant to wrap up school plays during Buwan ng Wika. Two scenes caught my attention. The brief CGI of the Manila Cathedral in the opening sequences excited me. Kaya naman pala natin gumawa ng ganito. Mahusay. Second was the scene where the Recollect Friars watched the shadow play. In the conversation, one Recollect implied that the fate of the Gomburza to the Garote would do more harm than an, than an advantage to the Friars' cause against the secular priests. Surprisingly, he disapp- disapproved of their rivals dying in Bagumbayan. At least, these friars, depicted to be against Burgos at the beginning, were not shown simply viciously laughing over Gomburza's fate. More of this sana sa mga period drama set in, co- in the colonial era. The attempt to cast a gray area that exposes the complex reality of our history. Thankfully, we are beginning to depart from the, be- the usual bida contra bida trope where the protagonist is nearly flawless while the antagonist is pure evil. Tarog's General Luna masterfully crafted this. No wonder its storytelling is compelling. Kasi aminan na natin, the baddies are not always found among the ranks of the Spaniards or the friars. Some of them come from the side of the revolutionaries and so-called quote-unquote patriots too. Gumburza did not fully embrace this sort of narration for apparent reasons. The film tries to deliver a particular message Naiintindihan na natin yan. Yoknos Gomburza is a welcome addition to the growing historical drama genre set during the colonial period. The fact that we can now produce films that convincingly construct a bygone era makes me look forward to movies that are not adapted from actual events but a fictional story set against the complexities of the colonial period. How about the political drama surrounding the Governor General's Palace or a detective story that begins with the mysterious death of a friar in 19th century Intramuros. And if I add, perhaps also depict the scene where uh, one governor general was assassinated in his own palace in Manila. Our past societies are replete with socio-cultural contexts that may serve as playgrounds for visionary storytellers. Storytellers. Ah, storytellers, rather. Man. All we need at the moment are filmmakers who will dare to take the challenge. End of quote. So, for this certain Dominican friar, at the very least, Pepe Diokno did his homework. It's not complete. It's not perfect. But it was better than all the previous biopics uh, other than Tarog's historical films. So that's that. And you know, one more thing that I am certainly uh, certainly criticizing this film for is the lack of traditional Catholics who would serve as technical advisors for this film. Traditional Catholics would have been vital in making the film very faithful to the time period. Because... Uh, from my sources, there were no traditional mind, tradition-minded Catholics that were consulted in the creation of this film. And also, if not the Dominicans, why not TBA Studios? Why MQuest? Why do, do, did the Jesuits partner with MQuest instead of TBA when, they ha- when TBA ha- already has a lot of experience when it comes to biopics from the two films that they created? And perhaps also to the, um, perhaps also to the other films that they uh, that they created and perhaps distributed. TBA Studios was the one who uh, distributed Sound of Freedom. If I uh, uh, to uh, to let you know, I mean I don't know, but perhaps uh, the Jesuits are saying 
maybe this is overplay if we're gonna partner with TBA, but it would have been nice if uh if uh if I had a say in the film. So that's a wrap on the <laughs> that's a wrap on the uh on the shitting of uh of Gomburza. I do uh apologize for all of the bad stuff or the uh you know the bad words that I have said uh you know I just uh I just wanted to uh I just wanted to uh convey uh I just wanted to convey my personal sentiments when it comes to uh the criticisms that I have for that film so given all the good, bad, and ugly of the film. Sadly, I rate Gomburza with a score of 4.5 out of 10. Four and a half. So, uh, if uh, the, the passing score is 5, this almost passed. Why, you ask? Well, there are things that are very much... Um, commendable within the authentic uh, portrayals or the artistic portrayals rather it lacked the necessary historical context and due diligence in uh in terms of accuracy as well as technical consultations perhaps i am also livid about chuka being an extra in the film uh but it has been balanced out by me not having the time to audition for a role. I do wanted to um, audition for at, for at least a, for, a, for an extra uh, extra role or a, a role as an extra in the film. However, I do not have the time and that w- that's going to be one of the things that I would regret for the rest of my life. But more importantly, uh, it's the i guess um it's balanced out by the satisfactory acting of Cedric Juan as Padre Jose Burgos because he uh this this um acting of Cedric Juan uh, as Padre Burgos landed him uh a best actor award for the MMFF so uh good on him good on him again also TLM going catholic intellectuals like Romel Lopez of Press 1 Philippines or Kaloy Palad, both of which are good contacts of mine, would have been good technical consultants for the film. Alas, they were sidelined. So, that's basically my review of Gomburza uh, as a film. So, I am personally uh, disappointed that they are... uh, they only had a 4.5 out of 10 for me, from me rather. But given the current state of Philippine cinema nowadays, with cheap films like the ones in Viva Max and all that shit, you know, it's much better. I guess I I was more cruel in reviewing this film. Uh, unlike Goldwyn reviews or the other um movie re- other Filipino movie reviewers out-, out there, but I am reviewing this as a history buff, not as a, not just as a cinema um cinema file. Uh, who is looking for the technicalities and all that shit? Mind you, I also think of uh think of uh cinema sins in the in the uh, there there are cinema sins in the film, but. Uh, it was over. It was overshadowed by the lack of due diligence by Pepe Diokno. So that's that. And being someone who adheres to the belief in, of the divine in collaboration with human endeavors, perhaps I would close this podcast episode by inviting you to pray for the repose of the souls of Fathers Pedro Pelaez, Mariano Gomez. Jose Burgos, and Jacinto Zamora. O God, who was pleased 
to raise thy servants, Mariano, Pedro, Jose, and Jacinto, to the dignity of the priesthood. Vouchsafe to number them with thy priests forever and more. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Almighty God, who hast given us these good islands, the pearl of the Orient Seas, for our heritage, we humbly beseech thee that we may always prove ourselves a people mindful of thy favor and glad to do thy will. Bless our islands with honorable industry, sound learning, and pure manners. Save us from violence, discord, and confusion, from pride and arrogance, and from every evil way. Defend our liberties, and fashion into one united people the multitudes brought hither out of many kindreds and tongues. And do with the spirit of wisdom those to whom in thy name we entrust the authority of government, that there may be justice and peace at home, and that through obedience to thy law, we may show forth thy praise among the nations of the earth. In the time of prosperity, fill our hearts with thankfulness, and in the day of trouble, suffer not our trust in thee to fail. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. On that note, I end uh, this special episode of the Intrepid Podcast. I would like to thank you all for listening, even though this is already uh, one hour. Uh, but yeah, that's, uh, that happens. Now, the recording for this episode would be available on YouTube and Spotify with further plans to expand to other platforms, so please make sure to check out for that. All of the materials I have referenced for this episode would also be listed in the recording's description and in the Spotify show notes. And if you think there are things that I might not have included in this recording, or if you want to have your say about the matter, please feel free to leave them in the comments below, if applicable. Also, before you go, please make sure to like this video if you're on YouTube and share this around. Subscribe as well to my YouTube channel, Intrepid Ian Rinyon, and ring the notification bell by selecting all so that you wouldn't miss out whatever future content I may create. Please follow me along as well on Spotify for more podcast episodes so that you can also listen uh, to the Intrepid podcast even without uh, watching uh, a 30 to 60 minute video uh, without any video content and, but just, uh, but just uh, audio, if you know what I mean. So you can always watch or listen to the Intrepid podcast uh, on the go. Perhaps if you're on the bus or if you're at work, keep me on the background my, uh, if, if, that's, uh, if that's okay. Now, with all that said, this is Intrepid Ian Rinyon reminding you to at all times be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Until then, look alive, stay alive, be kind to yourself and to each other, and as always, thank you for tuning in. From here in Intrepid HQ, always remember to know our history. See you next time for another talk here on the Intrepid Podcast. Ian out.